you can ask now uh, or you can post any questions in the chat as we go or ask at the end of each subsection if you feel are we ready any questions okay so we will start with the first topic So the first topic we're going to be discussing is basic automation for um, your home environment that we're living in. Um, just trying to move this open screen. Um, Ingrid, just before I continue, you, have you started recording? Yeah, I've started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So here we go. Basic automation. Um, there's a student presentation as well, just so everyone understands. Um, here we go. Um, so the, just before we start off going into what the basic automation options are and um, how everything works, I did want to highlight um, some of the FND symptoms that can be present. These are not all of them, but these are some of the symptoms that can be present um, in uh, persons experiencing FND. Um, um, so, firstly, we have uh, movement and functionality. Um, so, this is one of the subsections of the symptoms. Uh, we can find weakness and paralysis, um, abnormal movement, which is can be seen as tremors or difficulty walking, uh, loss of balance, uh, difficulty swallowing, which can be seen with speech as well. Um, so seizures and episodes of shaking, loss of consciousness, which you might see as drop attacks, um, the inability to speak or slurred speech, you'd see. Um, with the senses, you might find numbness, in limbs or around the body, uh, vision vision impairments or vision problems such as blindness or double vision. Uh, and there is some cognitive uh, symptoms present as well, which could be uh, such as memory and concentration uh, difficulties. Um, so these aspects do influence the assessment that they will carry out to determine what uh, automation is needed in your home environment. So firstly, we will talk about doors for automation. So the basic automation options for doors do allow for two types of doors or two options for doors, which is one swinging doors and one is sliding doors. Um, the swinging doors use a, a hydraulic arm to access and sort of open and close the door itself um, using uh, the application on your phone. So the system itself links directly to your phone or your device that you prefer to use, your iPad, uh, your computer, your Windows computer. Um, and it's activated and op uh, locked or unlocked using the app. Uh, the sliding door sort of uses the same mechanism, just without the hydraulic arm, it uses a belt or a gear chain. Um, same system, unlock, lock, open using your phone. Um, you can use a hard button uh, to open the doors as well if you don't want to use the applications on the phone, uh, which can be located near the door somewhere, which is easy for you to reach based on um, your accessibility. Uh, the two options that I do display here are just to show you the, vari the variations. It's not all of the options that are available. There are quite a few. Uh, the one on the left is the Samsung Smart Lock. Um, it does link directly to your phone. It allows you to enter the password and unlock the door and everything on the phone itself. So you don't actually have to touch the lock alone. But it does give you the option to actually unlock the door off the pad itself if you, if you want to do. And the one on the right-hand side is the Yale Silver Digit uh, Unit Entrance Lock. Also the same system. It's a smart lock straight to the phone. Um, easy, to, easy to use. Um, and you can also use it manually if you wanted to um and very easy to sort of um, understand uh, so i do have a question from fiona um do we have a battery backup if there's a power outage um, so most of these systems do come with uh, a battery sort of capacity to last a duration of time should there be an outage um it's usually like around i think three to six hours something like that um they do give you backup um, sort of units to put in, should it switch off uh, and sort of get stuck closed if the outage is for too long. Um, 
but there is the, with with that being said, with the one on the right hand side, the Yale uh, silver digit lock, it does have that manual component, so you can actually sort of use your hand to unlock it if you wanted to. Um, yeah. Um, get the next one. So, what are the advantages um, of the automated doors? Um, the the door allows for independency for someone to get in and out of the house. Um, the system is very basic, so it, it allows for um, low cognition load. Uh, it won't sort of it won't take too much understanding to sort of know how to really use it. Um, it is used by the application, like I said um, previously. You can use it off uh, your wheelchair screen as well. It can be linked to that using an i device, which is an external device that you would have to purchase uh, that links your phone, uh, your wheelchair joystick unit to a switch control um which i will discuss further i will discuss the switch options at a later stage um it does increase your safety when you're at home alone because it allows you to sort of move around at will um and it does give you that uh, ability to get in and out of your house um if you wanted to go outside into the backyard um, so these options the doors options are there for people that do have these difficulties with opening doors and closing doors if you are wheelchair bound or um if you do have really bad tremors and you struggle to sort of open levers and stuff like that, um, these are very good options. Um, the difficulties with the automated, uh, the disadvantages, uh, sorry, about the automated doors are um, most of them only allow one way movement. So it's either enter or exit with the swinging doors. Um, and this is, um, this is due, uh, primarily due to the hydraulic arm. So the hydraulic arm is placed on one side. Um, you couldn't have it on both sides. Um, so if you are, if you do want the hydraulic arm door, the swinging door, you have to decide which which way is the most needed, the most desired option. Uh, and because to get out of the other way, you would need a carer to help you if you were trying to exit. That goes against the hydraulic arm. Um, the second option would be the blinds. Um, so blinds. Um, like the doors can be linked to a smart device. Um, some of the blind options that you can get, like the one you can see on the side is from iSeq blinds. It does link directly to your phone. Um, these are motorized blinds um, and they do work through various different access methods. You can use the phone, you can use the hard buttons control itself. You can use Google Home, Amazon Alexa or Apple HomeKit. Um, that's basically um, that's that's dependent on your pre preference. So if you're an Apple user, Google Home. Um, if you, I mean, uh, Apple uh, HomeKit. If you're an Android user, Google Home, Amazon Alexa. I think works with uh, Android as well. Um, but yeah, so these 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 blind options do come in various materials, various colors, various lengths. Um, they're very good options if you um, do have difficulty with sort of opening windows and um, moving curtains and stuff like that. And you just wanted to get access to light in your apartment um, during your day and bringing down the, the curtains at night if you wanted like the light from the outside not to come in and keep you awake. Um, the advantages are they also very basic and it's a basic design. It doesn't take a long time to install. It's very easy to put in place um, and a very low cognitive demand again. Um, next, we will be talking about um, lighting and entertainment systems. Um, so this is this is the more diverse system, and the big, it's a, it has a much larger range of options than any of the other um, sort of basic automations that we will be and have discussed. Um, so one of the main ones that we do see being used in homes is the Housemate um, 5S, which is the latest model. Um, it connects directly to the applications that you do, you choose to use and lets you link that to your phone. Um, so that would be your iPad, iPhone, Android, uh, a Windows uh, computer, Windows laptop, anything like that. Um, they, what they do is they can be used through Google Home, the Smart Things, which is an Android um, application center, um, HomeKit, which is an Apple center, and how they work is they learn an infrared signal from the device. So say it's a TV, um, 
the, the actual unit itself learns the infrared signal that is sent from your controller itself to activate the TV and learns the coding. So you can learn, do that off your phone itself instead of pressing the hard button on the controller. Let that be your television, your lights, um, your fan, your vacuum, your, most of your most of your electronic units within your household could probably be linked due to infrared signals. If they don't use infrared signals, then it becomes very hard because it's a different wavelength. It, it, there is different units in place that can learn Z waves, which is a different type of wavelength. Um, but those are those are different. That's not your basic automation. That's more a bit more advanced. Um, but those options are there if you wanted to fund them yourself. Um, there are cheaper options than paying for the housemate because it is pretty costly. Um, it costs, uh, I think it's around like 2,500 if I'm correct. Um, so it is a pretty costly unit to have. It is useful, but it is costly. Um, but you can get a universal remote instead. Like the one you see on the top right, that, that is a housemate light. So that is the smaller unit. Um, that sort of does the same thing without the application on the phone. So it doesn't have that access to touch screen and all that stuff. It's It has 10, 10 buttons on it that can be used for two functions each. So it's it allows you to use 20 different functions. So same. So what you can do with the, the, the smart, uh, the universal remote is set each button to do multiple, so a multiple step task. So that could be once the TV is on, once you've turned the television on, you can, you can type in a channel that you're trying to search for just using that one button because it can learn that infrared signal code for those three tasks. So say you were typing in 502, you can, you can code that to one button and the remote, once you press that button, it will type in 502 each time the television is on. Um, the second cheaper option to controlling your environment is an innovative smart switch which works off your phone, but it uses an external module as well. Um, these smart switches have to be bought separately. They use a Wi-Fi signal um, to connect to the actual um, unit itself, which receives the signal from your phone to activate the switch. Um, these options are um, cheaper, uh, but if you wanted to, you could get, we have a wonderful company in Australia, that's Technical Solutions. Um, they can give you a simpler option where they give you a single switch um single switch unit to just do the simple task as such as turn on and off so should it be um your television on off they can help you with that um with the light on off they can help you with that um the only problem with that 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 solution is you can't you can't really do diverse tasks you've got to do the on off system you can't really you can't change channels you can't adjust fan speed you can't adjust light dimness or brightness um yeah but that option is there um the advantages of these systems though uh that they do allow the individuals that are experiencing fnd and other disabilities to have this sort of independency to control their home environment and feel involved in um, having control over what's happening in their home um, so if you are living alone or if you, there is periods in your day where you are alone at home and you are experiencing FND and you have trouble with tremors and you have trouble with cognition and stuff like that, concentration, memory, it's, it does help to have these systems in place. Um, one, with tremors, you don't have to worry about trying to get all the buttons pressed if you have a single touch system. Um, with cognition, you don't have to try and remember the steps to put it on. You can put stickers onto the, the um, little housemate light to remind you what each one does. So you don't have to remember the tasks. You can just put a television on there. It'll tell you it's a television turn on. You can press it. Yep, they, they, they do help quite a bit. With air conditioning units, it's very similar to the um, home entertainment systems. Um, they do also connect to your smartphone or smart device, iPad, stuff like that. Um, again, they use infrared signals to control the system by learning the coding. Um, and here on in the image on the right-hand side is what I was trying to explain earlier with the wheelchair unit, your wheelchair joystick unit uh, being used as the actual control center for the applications. 
Um, and the little module that you see, this little module that you see here, this is your little iDevice Blue, uh, Bluetooth unit that links your switch control on your joystick to your phone. So it does allow you to actually use the joystick as a switch itself. Um, so you click the joystick to the right-hand side, that could be like a scanning function. You click the joystick down, that could be a selection function. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty useful sort of um, assistive technology in place. Um, but it, you have to be mindful that each insurance scheme does have different criteria to be met when they are trying to fund these sort of basic automation systems. Um, so I know for NDIS, when they look at these technologies and this equipment, they, one of their main criteria is this has to be a, disable, a disability enabling modification. Um, if it's just there to help you sort of do more when you can do it without the system, then they probably wouldn't fund it. Um, but if it's a need for you to have more control of your environment um, and get you more involved, then it's probably going to be beneficial for you to have it as well. Um, so like I said earlier, technical solutions, they do the, with the single switch um, modifications that they can do, they can do that with your air conditioning units as well. Um, it's, it's again, a very basic system that they can do on off, which does have its, its, its concerns given that you can't adjust the temperature of the air conditioning unit. Uh, so once it's turned on, it's either it's set to a temperature. So be that the most comfortable temperature for you, 23 degrees or 24 degrees Celsius, um, it cannot be changed unless someone actually changes that for you or if you have the ability to actually get up and change that yourself. Um, the, the switches that you, that you could be using to sort of do the on off switch are, I've, I have put them below. It's your jelly bean switch, your sip and puff switch, pad switch, and your cushion switch. I will show you what they look like um, in a second. Um, but there is a variety of switches that you could use. Um, there's, there's a lot of switches in the market. Um, and they very, they tailored to very specific needs from in, within, for individuals with uh, different differing disabilities and limitations and stuff like that. Um, why would you need an air conditioning unit control? If you have uh, thermoregulation problems, if you can't control your body temperature, it's probably a very good idea to have some sort of control over the temperature in your household. Um, with increasing temperature or decreasing temperature, we know that symptoms can be exacerbated um, for individuals with FND. So this is probably a very good area to be looking into if you do have those thermoregulation concerns. This is the, the switches that I was just discussing uh, previously. Your jelly bean switch is on your left-hand side. So it is the switch on the top, but I did, I did show the mechanism that they use in place to hold it. So that is your mount. Um, this, this mount would be used or can be placed on sort of any, any, any area that you would need the switch. It, sh uh, should that be your wheelchair, your uh, desk, um, your bed, um, it just allows for that accessibility and for the switch to actually be moved around when you need it. Um, this is your serpent's uh, pop switch. It has the same sort of mounting point where you can actually use it on multiple different multiple different bases. It allows you to move the switch around and use it. The sip and puff system, so you can see it's a little, little flexible hose. It is a sip and puff system that allows two functions. So puff was one, sip is one. Um, so let puff be a, a scanning function and sip be a selection function. Uh, your jelly bean switch is usually one, but I think you can use it as two if you do a holding function. Um, with your pad switch, it's as it says, a pad switch, it's, it's very basic. It's touch the pad and it, it does the switch. Um, these switches tend to be a bit, a bit easier, but not as commonly used, um, just due to the area that it takes up, like on your lap when you're trying to use it. I find that I see a lot more of the jelly bean and sip and puff switch uh, or the joystick being used. Um, your cushion switch, which this one's by Glasshouse, which is also a pretty good company uh, that produces quite a few um, assistive technology uh, products. 
Um, the cushion switch is similar to the uh, jelly bean switch, just a lot softer. So if you do have skin integration, uh, integration issues or you do have skin concerns or sensitivity, numbness, tingling, um, it does help that it has the padding. Uh, it's not so, so harsh on your skin. Um, yeah. What are the advantages of the a controlling the AC units, your automated AC units? The independent control of your living environment, as we mentioned, um, it's important uh, for the participants with thermoregulation concerns, as we mentioned. Um, the disadvantages of these units, like we said, it only has that on-off system. Um, you can't change the temperature yourself. Um, yeah. Then we move on to the electrical bed control. Um, before we do move into the information around the uh, electrical bed control, I want to uh, I want to just bring to attention that this, the image that I have used is a split system. So um, this is not a system that NDIS will fund. NDIS will only fund a king size bed or up to a king size bed. If you wanted a split system, you would actually have to um, fund that yourself. You'd have to fund the difference um, just because the funding is usually, your, your plan is usually for, or mo most of the time is for the participant themselves and not for the second person in the house or the carer, the partner or child. Um, yeah. So how this works is it can be used with the switch control, the switch system. Uh, should it be one of the systems that the switches that I showed you before or one of the other systems on the market? Um, it allows for control of elevation and reclination. Um, so this does allow you to um, have better control of your uh, sleeping posture um, or to get you more involved into um, your entertainment systems in the room or help you get out of bed easier if you needed to get, uh, with, if you have problems see, uh, sitting up. Um, um, so then again, um, I'm going back to, um, I'm going back to your, um, your sizing of your bed. Um, so what we'll be funding is the, NDIS funds your your king your king size single bed, um, and obviously if you wanted upgrades, then you have to fund that difference yourself. Um, the advantages change advantages like we mentioned before, it uh, does assist with your breathing and difficulties while you're sleeping. If you do have difficulties um, with your uh, breathing uh, rhythm and system. Um, it does help with pressure relief if you're stuck in one position for too long. We've we know that that can result in pressure sores and um, so some skin concerns. Um, it does reduce pain due to uh, the adjustability. Um, it increases the engagement with your entertainment systems, as we mentioned before. Um, it also does help you get out of bed, which is another another advantage. The disadvantages, though, is that. It can be a costly system to put in place, um, and especially if you're trying to uh, get the split, the isolated integration system, which is the two the two adjustable sides. Um, it can be very costly because these are very advanced systems, uh, but the, the option is there. And that's it for the basic automation. Um, I'm not sure if there is there any any uh, questions if you do have please ask if, or put in the chat and i will try my best to answer you um, i'll give you a couple of minutes and then we'll move on to ingrid's presentation Okay, we'll move on to Ingrid's. If there's questions, um, please put in the chat or ask us at the end of everything. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Miguel. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Can everyone see it well? Yeah. So um, I'd like to introduce you some options for alternative RAMs um, to permanent RAMs today. And before we go into alternative ramps, let's talk about what a permanent ramp is. So permanent ramps are exactly what they sound like. 
they are installed to remain permanently on the site where they are constructed so they cannot be moved or adjusted. And they would be suitable for someone with a permanent disability or degenerative condition because a permanent ramp would be beneficial to them in the long term. But even though FND is a lifelong condition and installing a permanent ramp would be beneficial, there are still circumstances that a permanent ramp cannot or is not suitable to be installed. So do you have any idea on when do we need a temporary or portable ramp? There are four situations here and I will go through them one by one. So I want you to show me a thumbs up if you think it's um, a temporary ramp or a portable ramp would be helpful in that situation and a thumbs down if you think that it would not be useful. So you can also use the reaction button or type it in the chat if you don't want to turn your camera on. So let's go to the first situation. So it says, my house is rented. Oh wait, I think, um, can you see my screen well? Yeah, so my house is rented, but I need a ramp to get into my house. So what do you guys think? Yes? Yeah, yeah, so you guys are right. So when the person is living in a rented house, it might be hard for them to get the permission from their landlord to install a permanent ramp to the house. So in this case, a temporary ramp would be useful because it can be removed or adjusted anytime you want. And for the second situation, it says, I want a ramp that can be taken along with me in my vehicle. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, a temporary or portable ramp would also be helpful in this case. It is quite obvious. So if the person wants a ramp that can be taken along with them, the ramp has to be portable. So with a portable ramp, it can be easier for them to get on and off their car. And the ramp can also be stored in the vehicle. So it is convenient and helpful when they need to access the community, say visit their family and friends or going to therapy sessions, things like that. So for the third situation, it says, I do not need a ramp, but my mom will need one when she visits me. What do you guys think? Mm -hmm. I see some different answers here. So actually, temporary or portable ramp would also be helpful in this case. So um, this is a common situation. So temporary ramps are great for homes where the residents don't need a ramp, but their frequent visitors do. So if you need a ramp to access, say, your brother's house, you may consider putting a portable ramp in this house. So, so it would be handy every time you visit him, he can bring out the ramp. So for the last situation here, it says there is a small step to my front door, but removing it is expensive. What do you guys think? Yeah, I see some different answers here as well. So um, actually it is also helpful to use a temporary or portable ramp here. So um, temporary ramps are actually handy when the person do not want to spend a lot of time and money building a permanent ramp or removing a step in their house. So, so temporary or portable ramps are usually made of durable, lightweight aluminum that will not rust or rot from the outdoor elements. So this makes them almost maintenance free. And also they are available in different lengths and are ideal for scooters, wheelchairs, walkers, and other mo uh, mobility equipment. So they are slip resistant 
and they can be set up quickly and easily. So basically, I'm going to introduce you four different alternative ramp options, and they are semi-permanent ramps, channel ramps, suitcase and trifold ramps, and threshold ramps. So let's start with semi-permanent ramps. So semi-permanent ramps are made to be installed as part of the house, but they are typically designed to be removed easily and adjusted if needed. It's a combination of permanent and portable ramps, which has the durability of the permanent ramp and the versatility of a portable ramp. So the most popular type of semi-permanent ramp is the aluminium modular ramp, which shows in the um, pictures on the right. So the good thing is that they are easy to install in just a few hours. So there are also different materials available in the market for semi-permanent ramps. So you can choose whatever you want according to your needs. So the next ramp that I'm gonna introduce is the channel ramps, which is a two piece ramp. And this type of ramp is generally the cheapest portable ramp available in the market. It's easy to handle as they are lighter than other types of portable ramps. So other than being accessible, light in weight, and the most affordable option in the market, channel ramps are also well suited for self-propelled wheelchairs and some four-wheel scooters. However, they cannot be used with a three-wheel scooter and they need to be placed at the correct distance apart for the wheelchair or scooter to travel on. So the third type a ramp that I'm going to introduce is the suitcase or, uh, or trivote ramp. So suitcase or trivote ramps are full weight ramps that can be folded in half of their entire length. They have a carrying handle in the middle so that you can carry them just like a suitcase. So that's why you call it a suitcase ramp. If you need a suitcase ramp that is longer than 1.5 meters, you should choose a trifold design. So the good thing for suitcase or trifold ramps is that um, with the suitcase-like feature, it is easy to carry around. And when using a suitcase ramp, you don't have to be perfect in positioning like when you are using a channel ramp. It is also more durable than channel ramps because a stronger material is used. However, since more materials are used for a stronger construction when comparing with channel ramps, suitcase or trifold ramps are often heavier and can be more challenging for the user's carer, friend or family member to transport and store the ramp especially when a long suitcase ramp with a length of over one and a half meters is used as they can only be folded into half of their length. So the last type of ramp that I'm gonna introduce is the threshold ramp. So threshold ramps are small ramps that are designed to be used in a doorway to overcome door frame thresholds of up to three inches. They usually do not require to be rested on the actual threshold itself and is a common solution to replace a permanent ramp. So threshold ramps are small and light in weight, so it's easy to transport. And they have a typical height range of one to three inches. And they can either be permanently screwed to the floor or to be portable. So you can take them with you every time you go to a different place. So although portable or temporary ramps are good in different ways, there are still challenges and things to be aware of when you use them. So ramp users are often dependent on a carer 
friend or family member. So when they are staying at home alone and the ramp is not put in place for use, they would be trapped inside the house or a particular area for a long period of time. So be mindful that if you are having a portable or temporary ramp, make sure that the ramp is put into place before letting your carer, family member or friend leave the house. So this is what I would like to share today. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now or type in the chat. Yeah. And um, if there isn't any questions at the moment, um, I will pass the stage to Elva and she'll talk about some options for kitchen alternatives. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, just let me share my screen. Yep. So today I'll be talking about some options for kitchen alternatives, which they are some great kitchen equipments and appliance that could allow you to achieve or attain some competence in the kitchen that is more manageable for independent living. So before we start, I have some questions. Uh, so we can figure out some questions together. And the first one would be like, have you ever experienced a time when the fatigue was so intense that you could barely get yourself into the kitchen and you can't really slice the food, dice the food or even cook the food? Have you guys ever experienced that before? Yeah, I can see some yes from your face. Yep. And then the second one would be, have you ever forgotten when that you were cooking and left the stove on unattended and probably accidentally set the house on fire before? <laughs> yeah, I can see Lian, you are trying to say something. <laughs> so I assume you have tried this before. Okay, and then the final question would be like, do you feel like you don't have enough circulation space in your kitchen when you are using a wheelie walker or wheelchair? So, so if you have any of the uh, questions, then probably the uh, options that I'm going to discuss would be helpful. So the first one would be an air fryer. And this uh, kind of uh, multi-use appliance and which can help to reduce the number of machinery and equipment that you need in the kitchen. And it also helps to reduce the amount of space needed because even the biggest air fryer will not really dominate lots of space in your kitchen. And most of them are only e size of a small oven or coffee machine, which they are very small enough to use it on the kind of top of in your kitchen. And also they are very easy to use. You can just simply throw your fruit inside like onion rings or chicken rings or some vegetables inside and set the mode and the timer, and that's it. And you can also use the air fryer to reheat leftovers as well. And it is also safe to use, and it protects you from heat and spattering oil. And it will also automatically shut off when the timer ends, so to prevent your food from burning, and you don't really have to worry about forgetting to turn it off and causing a fire anymore. But however, some of them could be a little bit costly. It depends on the brand. And different types of air fryers would have different settings and mode, which means that even you put the same food in different, kind, different brand of air fryer, they will have different settings and your food may get burned or dried. It depends on the brand of the air fryer. So before you use the air fryer, please make, just make sure you have read 
the instruction book less carefully to avoid that. And the next option would be using a convention microwave. And this is very similar to the air fryer, which is also safe to use and easy to use because you just have to put all your food inside, set the timer, set the mode, that's it. And conventional microwave is also possible and can be flexible in height, which you could decide where to locate. And so it could be more accessible to you. And it also allows some kind of additional functions, such as it can be served as a bench top. And the next one would be about fridge. And you can also consider using a narrow fridge to provide some additional space for you. So uh, you can use that kind of space for maybe other appliance or you can, you can have more circulation space if you are using a wheelchair or wheelie walker in the kitchen. And you can also consider using this kind of horizontal under counter fridge because it also saves space and it will be more accessible for wheelchair user because you can see it's kind of lower in height. And in order to make your pantry more accessible, we can also make use of some kind of accessories or functions such as a pull down shelves. So I have a video here. So, uh, yeah. so this is a kind of pull down shelves and this, allow, uh, this allows you to reach for the shelves in the upper cabinet by just simply bringing them down to a reachable range. And things could be more accessible for wheelchair users as well. And also, you could also use the lazy systems or driver dividers. And they also allow for easy access, which you don't really have to pour through various container to get the container like very inside of the cabinet. You can just simply rotate to make things more uh, easy, easier to access. And other than the pull down shelves, you can also consider using this kind of electric powered adjustable cabinets, but it would be a bit costly compared to the pull down shelves. And this is, a, this is an electric internal shelving system, which you can just simply mount it into a wall cabinet like this. And you can just simply use a button to lower or raise the cabinet height to make it more accessible for you. Like when you're using a wheelchair or when you're in a standing position, it all works for you. And other than that, you can just simply access the items of the cabinet without really having to open the door. Like it just go down and it shows, shows, shows uh, here. And other than that, it's also safe to use. It is also equipped with a safety system. I think it's just in the, installed underneath here, underneath the shelves here. And it will just stop lowering when it comes into contact with, a, with an objects. Like for example, if there is a cup here and the shelves just go down and when it feels like it touches the cup underneath the shelf, the shell will just automatically stop going down anymore. And this helps to kind of prevent any potential uh, incidents or injuries and allows for uh, safe operation. So you don't really gonna get hurt by lowering the shelves. And yep, that's all for my part of the options for alternative uh, like uh, kitchen alternatives. Is there any questions for me or for the other two students? Hey, thanks for that. I can't see any questions mm -hmm. in here. Does anyone have any questions around the different technologies? 
So if you're looking at getting technologies, um, especially if you've got NDIS, seeing an occupational therapist can help with assessing what's right for you. Um, and if you're on NDIS, you probably need like a complex AT report to be submitted to NDIS. Is there any technology that can help with pressure sores? And yet, definitely. So you'd be looking at your pressure care mattresses. So with the adjustable bed, um, looking at mattresses that provide the right pressure relief. Um, likewise, with wheelchairs, you'd be looking at the right cushioning. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for your presentations and for trying to provide us opportunities to talk, but it's not always easy to do. Um, I, I would like to have seen some more of the kind of tools that I could use in like the kitchen to make it easier and safer for me to participate in cooking. And that, because that for me is, is, is an issue of a safety issue. Yeah, there are a lot of different appliances. So it's only been a selection presented today. Yeah. Um, if you look at various disability shops and outlets, um, or if you speak to an OT, they can probably assist you with what's going to be appropriate for you. Um, but if you Google um, disability kitchen items, there's a huge amount of variety of things that can meet specifically what you're looking for. Um, and otherwise, working with an occupational therapist, um, they will probably have a better idea around what will meet your specific needs. But there's all sorts of things around cutlery, um, the meal prep items, you know, cutting um, boards that might hold items which make it easier to cut and peel, um, thermomixers some people like. So there is a lot of items out there. Yeah, it, get, it gets overwhelming yeah and, and i the ot basically just told me to go and check it out okay. um so i'm trying to see online it's just getting mm -hmm. like i said it's overwhelming i'm yeah. not really quite sure okay do you have ndis not yet not yet Okay, um, potentially trying another OT who's going to work a bit more with you. I mean, we have OTs in our organisation and potentially some of this could be done by telehealth. Um, it's just really having a feel for what your needs are and then searching for the material and presenting options to you rather than asking you to go and find the items. Yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't give up. No, um, I was given a generic form for the, the public health here has. Okay. Um, yeah. But it's very generic and people with more capability than I have. Mm, okay. It would be useful, but for me it doesn't, uh, didn't have enough. Enough, enough support. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can get a chronic disease management plan from your GP which will provide a Medicare rebate to assist you um, in getting OT sessions. Yeah, it's, it's hard here to yeah. get a, an OT. You can do telehealth. I mean, like our organisation offers telehealth services. Okay. And we can do a lot through telehealth. That, yeah. that may have to be the option I take because mm. it's, hasn't been helpful so far for yeah. OT support. Yeah, and a lot of people, depending on where they live, they have problems trying to find the right supports where they live. So that's why telehealth has been so useful mm -hmm. to help reach people across Australia. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. That's okay. That's okay. Ingrid Elba, a girl. Um, and someone's asked, what about underbench cupboards? Is there anything for sliding out shelves? Basically, anything 
is a possibility. Um, it comes down to cost. So definitely there are options for sliding out shelves, um, but it does come down to cost. Um, and if you're under NDIS, NDIS saying that it's regarded as reasonable and necessary and disability specific, and then finding someone to design the right solutions. But yeah, definitely there are all sorts of options and options for cupboards, moving shelves, moving, um, yeah. Anything else that people want to say? Or if you don't want to speak up, you can put it in the chat function. Just wait a couple of minutes, see if anyone wants to document anything. Otherwise, we'll end up to that. Oh, hold on. Can the temporary ramps be used if you have a lip in your doorway? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what I've done is I've got these Tyrex ramps. So they're made of old tyres and they're really good for dealing with the lip. So you can have a lip like that or you can have a lip like that. So it's basically made to measure. Um, but absolutely, you can get some at Bunnings, but I haven't found the Bunnings ones to be as good as when they're made to measure. Um, the made to measure ones are more durable and they don't move as much where I found the Bunnings ones tend to move. Um, but absolutely, all those lips, um, the lip like into the bathroom, all of those things can be addressed. And again, um, speaking to an OT would be helpful. Yep. Do you, did you want to say something else? Okay, cool. Thanks. Hi, it's yep, Fiona. Fiona. Yep. Um, wanted to find out uh, the trifolding ones. Do you know whether if there's a maximum weight load for them for, say, the large um, powered wheelchairs? Yeah, so they do all have maximum weight loads, um, but they all vary. So yeah. it's around finding one that's suitable for your wheelchair plus your weight on top of the wheelchair. Yeah. Um, so the channel ones are obviously not as durable, mm -hmm. but when you when you go to look at those ramps, they do say what is the loading capacity. Yep. And, you know, there are ones that are made to accommodate um, power wheelchairs plus a person on top of it. So it's yep. just around finding the right one. Um, and obviously the more durable ones are more heavier and they're also more expensive. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're just about on time. So nothing else. Okay, well, thank you um, to our OT students, so Masters of Occupational Therapy. Um, that's been really good. And um, I'll catch you guys with the OTs. I'll catch you next week. Um, and the others, I'll see you on the group. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. See you. Bye.